how are you? I'm doing fantastic. <laughs> Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank this you is for amazing. having me. <laughs> so growing up in Virginia on the East Coast. Yes. What brought you to film first? What was your first kind of a, you know, interaction with film? Um, how did you get introduced to film? Well, I was born in California, so I was transferred back to Virginia when I was 15. But um, I remember I was living in Colton at the time, which is uh, in San Bernardino County, and went to the movie theater when I was really young. Um, cause I could, that's when you could still ride your bikes to the theater, and it was still kind of safe. You know, everything has kind of changed over time. But um, I was watching Aladdin, and that's what you do when you're a kid. You go to a movie, and you have to wa you know, watch cartoons. But um, I was really lost and alone, and um, just that something grabbed me that day in the theater where I just knew – like I had to do it and I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know. It just felt like this overwhelming, just knowing like this is what I have to do with my life so I can help, you know, other kids like me that are feeling lost and alone. And if I could, you know, have some kind of positive message in my life and it was coming from an animation at the time, then, you know, what can I do as a filmmaker to help others that are struggling like I was? But it, it just like, I don't know, it just like grabbed me from a very young age. Like how, how early? Like eight. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Did you enjoy watching movies? Did you enjoy, did you watch any behind the scenes, uh, like I on DVDs or anything like that? Not till I was older, like 18, 19, but um, I enjoyed watching like the X-Files growing up and I watched a lot of Mickey Mouse Club. That was kind of like my jam, um, a Disney, Disney nerd. And then, um, but I just liked sci-fi from a very young age and started writing, you know, did a traditional, like I did theater in high school, trying to figure out like, okay, what is acting it? Acting too, like so. Yeah, 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 I wrote plays. I've been in a little bit of acting, some modeling, but it wasn't until I was 22 when my department manager, uh, Darlene Malat, sat me down and she's like, okay, April, you keep talking about it all the time. Why aren't you doing it? And I'm, I'm like this kid. I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, I don't know how to do it. I don't know where to start. I just don't know. She's like, well, here's a camera. Go shoot something and come back and show me. And this is at a bank. Like pe people at banks, you know, it's, it's the privacy law. I got a lot of things going on. And she just let me build this like corporate video. I had no idea what I was doing, but it's all it took was one person to believe in me because I didn't have the support system to let me, you know, grow. And she was the first one that gave me that opportunity. Hmm. It was same for me. Just all it takes is a one person. Yeah. And sometimes it's interesting how like the thing that is it for us is like right in front of you and y it's there the whole time and you can't see it. Like I've, I've been talking about wanting to make a movie and films and everything. Yeah. And love watching movies, going to the movie theaters. Speaking of that, what a strange experience in the last 12, 14 months not being able to go to movie theaters, I right? miss the movie theater. I was just telling my friend the day, I can't wait for them to open because I just want to sit there with my popcorn and just just not think and enjoy the experience. Like why our industry works so hard to create this magic, you know what I mean? Just support our fellow filmmakers. So I'm excited that they're starting to open up again, even though it's limited capacity, but it, it's an opportunity to go out and just experience something, you know? Well, young Tor here went to, drove to Vegas Opening weekend tenant, yes. Oh, how was that? That was fantastic. <laughs> I absolutely loved it. <laughs> I mean, I, I think the movie theater experience must have been great, but the movie sucks. <laughs> I haven't I, seen Tenet. I don't think it's bad. I enjoy it. I think it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I think somebody should have sit down with one of my favorite directors of all time and say, Hey, just because we have a lot of money doesn't make up for a good movie, you know? Like, That's let's take true. 747 and crash it into an airport terminal. And I was like, sure, cool. Like, But all that f told me cinema cinematically for the movie was like, you took 10, 15 million dollars and, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but it wasn't like, I didn't think it was anything super creative. Or anything. I was like, and you know, we, we've talked about this. I hate, this is my pet peeve for movies. I hate when I can't understand what the actors are saying. That's hard, yeah. But yeah. I'm not saying I don't understand English because English is my second language. I'm saying when the audio and the mum, like they were in the beginning of like the 15 first minutes of the movie, whatever, they're wearing these weird helmets and they're talking, there's dialogue underneath the helmets. And I had to put on subtitles because I couldn't, I was like, I have no idea what he's saying. Well, do you know the, the sound design is he, so apparently, I'll look this up right now too. Apparently, Chris Nolan doesn't do too much post sound in regards to like ADR. Um, and so that's why there's an issue with Bane and Dark Knight Rises yeah. and then why there's an issue a lot with Tenet. But 
Yeah. Well, somebody should tell him about ADR. <laughs> I think I, I think he made it to I think he made it to the level that they can afford to do some ADR. Yeah. <laughs> well, like, look, you're watching a movie. You go through the movie. Th it, like, I'm home, so I w I bought it. I'm watching it at home, so I can pause it, go back. Still can't understand it. Then have I can put on subtitles. But if you're yeah. in a movie theater and you, you want to enjoy the experience, and you're like, what the? Yeah. What, what are they saying? Say? Yeah. So that's my. Uh, I didn't know that was his style. I love it. That's interesting. What, what was your uh, favorite movie, Nolan's? I think we talked about it earlier, but. Uh, I, not a big Nolan fan. Mm. All right. Yeah, I'm not a big Nolan fan, and I uh, hope he's not listening. To yeah, I know. <laughs> it's ever. not that. I mean, <laughs> I gravitate more towards Spielberg and yeah. Patty Jenkins. Like, I really gravitate towards them. I have a lot of respect and admiration for the work that they do. And you know, I think Patty in herself has like shattered a glass ceiling for women filmmakers. You know, when she did Wonder Woman. The first one, and yes, I'm just please let's just mention the first one. <laughs> and you know, I just really respected her position and the love she poured into that film. I mean, you could read it the entire story in No Man's Land. That scene, I mean, it's just epic. Uh -huh. yeah. I loved the first Wonder Woman. I yeah. think the cast was great. Uh, Chris Pine is actually recently I kind of you know seen multiple movies, and I was like, he is. Part of me, like my generation, one of my favorite actors. I think he is really, really talented. He's come he's a long way. I mean, yes. he's, he's a really, he's well-rounded. And mm -hmm. you can like, put him in like any role and he just grabs it and just runs with it. You know what I mean? He's, he's, he's a definitely really, a really good actor. Did you have uh, family support when you were going through like the theater or anything? Was your family supportive of uh, this film adventure that you were kind of mm -hmm. like? The, not they at first. Not at first at no, all? No, it was like, it's not a real job and i'm not mm -hmm. gonna be just no i don't want to disrespect my family i love my family but it wasn't you know it, it's a, it's not a real job you're gonna be hungry you know what's your backup plan if it doesn't work out like that's that's what i had even so from my ex-husband you know he didn't support it either he's like that's not a real career like you're not gonna make money doing that and it was just a very difficult you know mm. road at first and it took a while for them to get on board but i just didn't give up with it at times i wanted to but um, once I landed a, a stronger support system and they could see like, okay, she's really serious about this. And I think honestly that came when I got on Captain Phillips as a, a runner PA and they realized, okay, she's making things happen. But it takes, a, you know, it takes a long time for that to happen. Was it more uh, consistency or was it the first paycheck that came in and like, look, this is real money? I'm not sure. I never really asked them that. You know, for me, it was, I like, even to this day, I'm like, consistency to me brings breakthrough. And like, I treat every job like it's my last because it could very well be our very last gig in the industry. And you want to really just revel in that moment that we have when we meet these people, like all these strangers coming together. Um, but for that, I think is because I worked with Tom Hanks on my first feature that to them was like okay she's making it now you mm -hmm. know what i mean it was just because i think it was the caliber of the movie the mega millions in in little tiny town norfolk virginia and i got a ch opportunity to go work with him huge opportunity it was and, and like i said before i didn't seek it out it found me it landed in my lap and like that's been a lot of my journey in the industry like i've, I've learned the more i fight and apply for things i don't get them and if i relax this weird balance and let go and just continue to stay focused and do the best that I can on every show. Then the next one comes without me having to like figure out, okay, where's my next check coming? How am I going to feed my kids? You know what I mean? Very hard. It's hard enough for us as a filmmakers to prove it to ourselves that this is a real career. Yeah. Then I can imagine have to then prove somebody like trying to convince your surrounding, your closest people to you. Like, no, this is something. So, my, my next question was going to be, well, when did you realize that this is something you can do as a career and that's something that you can, like, what was the turning point for you? Um, was it the Captain Phyllis Tom Hanks experience? No, I was in my undergrad uh, at Regent in Virginia Beach. At the time, it was the only film school, and it, it's a Christian college, and, you know, I... I actually value my my journey there. It, it changed my life in a lot of in a lot of po positive ways. Um, but I was the first undergrad in their history to get the endowment, and it was a big like thing. You got what? I'm sorry. An endowment. Can it's you seventeen thousand dollars from their trust to make a short film. Oh wow! Yeah, okay. and big deal. it was a really big deal at the time because that's unheard of, and there was this big rift between between grad students and undergrad students, and didn't matter how old you were, because I was an older college student at the time. I had my kids were like infants 
and I worked with uh, Josh Overbay, and he's still doing stuff today, but um, he recommended me to be his producer. At that time, I had did one commercial viral in my producer unit class. That's all I've done. Like, I don't know what I'm doing, <laughs> but they believed in me, and they saw something in me. And um, it, it was meant to be. Yeah, it really was, and because it was a sci-fi film about transplanting consciousnesses into different bodies, it was very risky for a Christian school. And I remember like Josh would call me in the middle of the night and he's like, um, promise me April, like we'll get this off the ground. Like this is so important to me. And I didn't know Josh very well. And I'm like, okay, if I say I promise you or I'm gonna make this commitment, like I will do whatever I can to get it, to get it done. Like that's just my work ethic. And I, I did. And there was so much kickback from the faculty because it was very risky subject matter for a Christian school. And um, we got it done and it shattered records in the film festivals. You know, it was a 2009 Student Academy Award national finalist. And Let's pause on that for a second. That doesn't happen to a lot of student films. No. So that's a pretty big deal. It is. It's, this is the, it is the Academy Awards. Yes. So that's pretty incredible. And I'm assuming that was a huge door opener to networking and some possibilities. Did you guys actually go to LA to, or was that a digital submission and you guys send it off? Or it was a digital submission. Josh had sent it off and it, it won the regionals and then it made the national finalists. Um, but the actual awards, they only took the top three, but we lost to USC because USC won the whole student category. That damn USC. Uh, right, but to have <laughs> a smaller school in competition with them, incredible. I think, it was a credible opportunity, and that's one I don't take lightly. Um, but, you know, Josh is a professor at a university. He's still making features. You know, he, he's had a really good run, and he continues, to, you know, to develop. And, and my path was a little bit different um, because, you know, my kids and the choices I had to make to support my family, like my, my world started out in commercials and advertising and tourism campaigns, and, and that's the door that opened for me. Nothing in L.A. opened for me, but in Virginia it did. What did you do in that in that field? Were you also a producer? Yes. Okay, so coming up with the content. Yeah, so I would get hired at the ad agency as an independent contractor, and they would have those, the lookbooks and storyboards done. Like, here's the budget. This is what I need. We need it by this and that. And that's what I, I, you know, I booked the models and actors and booked the crew mm -hmm. and, you know, executed from beginning to end. And then once all the materials are captured, the agency would take over again. So UPM slash producer. Yep. So I call it a field producer, but I mean, I'm sure that there's something else for it, but that's just what they usually hire me for. And now you've, uh, you know, I don't want to say graduated, but now you're consistently working, booking as a UPM. In the film unit industry. production manager. Yeah. Can we talk about a little bit what that is actually for people that even maybe don't know what it is? Um, we, we break down budgets <laughs> and we manage them on set. So we're in a production office and, you know, you work with unions every, you know, like the first thing I'm going to say is there is no such thing as a perfect budget. You're going to be over budget. That's just impossible in a reality, like a dreamland where you're going to have the perfect budget. That's never going to happen. But um, uh, you hire your crew, you build your production office team, you negotiate the contracts, you know what I mean? And, and you make sure everybody's like the days are made. It, it's a lot of paperwork and it's a lot of like managing and like really understanding the industry as a whole. And I just really, I just really thrive on that adrenaline rush. It's mm -hmm. just a rush for me. It's, it's so much fun. But then you kind of move along with the crew from pre-production and you are actually on the person on set yeah i go on set a lot too and it takes a happy balance for me when is the uh split between being a line producer and upm like line producing like literally just breaking down the budget because it's kind of versus you then kind of can you talk about that difference a little bit yeah i line produce as well but i think they kind of go hand in foot so like some some shows you might be doing both because it's pretty much the same thing it's more to me and it, someone might correct me if I'm wrong and so I, I apologize to those because I'm getting it wrong but my experience has been it's still you're still doing an initial budget breakdown you're still doing an initial breakdown before your AD comes and does an actual breakdown of the script and then they take over and they take it to another level those ADs yeah but that's what they're supposed to do they're supposed to take it and make it even better and um, it's the initial the initial breakdown but um, it's all about the budget in their line items, you know what I mean? It's yep. it's that initial like, uh, here's my script. I need the story. I need the whole like strip boards broke down, and then the budget broke down to a tentative idea. And then if there is a, a luxury to have the UPM, we take that budget and then we start managing based off where all those line items are going. 
It is a luxury to have a UPM. It is. It's very seldom that those indie shows have them, but when they do, you're like the only one in the production office, so you wear many hats. PC, UPM. Yep, production secretary. Line producer. PA. <laughs> you do like everything. So what was your first like uh, major real exposure? I remember... Uh, you know, working on some film in the Czech Republic in the Barandov studios when I was a, a young teenager from like a summer jobs where I would be a day player. Started with the costume department, then I moved up to stunts and just day player, just helping around, you know, ushering yeah. people around and whatnot. But then when I moved to Canada and I and then I did what I did in order to get into the union. And then I first went to visit my friend who is a first AD who got me into the union and showed like I was first walked in and we talked about it a little bit you know, on the set, I was just like, what? Yeah. <laughs> like, this is real, you know? I Because I grew up, especially being from Europe, growing up in Czech, like, I've only seen this on TV, like, yeah. on the DVD behind-the-scenes videos. I was like, wow, I wonder what that thing is for, like, the crane, the lights, you know, all that. And then I'm walking on set, and then and these people with cargo pants, and then DP, and somebody's looking into the viewfinder, and they're doing something, and then there's that thing that you push oh and I didn't dolly. even know what, yeah. what it was and I was like <laughs> wow and cranes and whatnot and what was your first uh, major exposure to like a real set when you were like wow this is amazing Captain Phillips it was hands down I mean I've done smaller things but to have and this is like to this day I, I still can tell you what I was wearing and the smells in the air and like the the, the atmosphere is like the first day on that show when I stepped onto that pier at the naval base and Tom Hanks is probably like five feet to my left and you could just see that stars and magic in my eyes because all this like mega millions of Hollywood is unfolding in front of me and I'm just like this is it this is where I want to be how do I get here from here you know what I mean because it's it is not very often in smaller towns you have those big shows coming and when you do you really got to take in those moments and be ready to learn because these are like LA's absolute best professionals coming and you have the opportunity to grow well a lot of people so this is kind of a true in anything like especially any kind of high career like achieving um, you know careers athletes or anything when you get to the top or when you come to where the top league is being played, like Captain Phillips set, you know, working with Tom Hanks, which I want to ask you how that was, by the way. But it's even harder than getting there. It's even harder to just stay there. So when you're now you're there, you're like, wow, this is you were probably thinking, how do I consistently come back to this? Yes, this is it's not like I don't want to go back to doing anything but this kind of stuff. So can you talk about that? Yeah, uh, I am still working towards that consistent level with that kind of mega millions. It's hard because it's a humbling process because, you know, I'm a producer, I'm a UPM, and in order to get there, it's still like you have to pay your dues and work your way up the ladder. There's no, honestly, there's no, there was no other way around it. And so I'll, I'll occasionally get those big shows, but, uh, you know, my role in the production office may change a little bit. It might flex to a coordinator or it might flex to a secretary. Um, but I'm willing to do that because I like I want to be like where they are because I really value like my, my professionalism and how I execute my shows and you know to be my my very best and there's always room for growth so um, I'm still working towards that consistency on that level it, it takes a long time hmm. what was your uh, so what was your process of the climbing of the ladder like the, the, the you did the, you're a UPM now you consistently getting kind of booked as a UPM yeah or in that level if it's like a larger larger show you might go into some you know, production coordinator but producer UPM now so what was the what was the journey the, the first exposure was Captain Phillips yeah first of all let's talk about that for a second T working with Tom <laughs> working with Tom Hanks hands down probably the the best actor of the last 50 yeah, years he's amazing and you know it's funny because he saw me taking in my moment he did and i didn't know he was watching me he's like you're new that's the first thing he said i'm like yeah i'm pretty green and he's like i'm tom i'm like hi i'm april and he was the nicest guy but he's like you picked a good first feature but Brian, I didn't choose it. it. It found me. And I'm so fortunate because not a lot of people get that experience for their first one. 
but he like that it blows my mind that he knew I was so new to the industry mm -hmm. because you can just tell. I mean, it was like this, all these moving parts. And you're just like a kid in the candy shop, like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I'm here. Somebody pinch me, you know. Like what's happening? Yeah, and I was just a runner PA. Like that's all I was doing. It wasn't anything significant, but to me it was the world. You know what I mean? To have that one moment, you know? Do you believe in uh, speaking things into an existence? I do. There's a lot of power in our words. So I'm very, very meticulous and careful what I say because, you know, like, I mean, thinking, wanting to do something, going after it, projecting it out there, and then eventually you're there and you're like, people are like, how did you do this? How did you end up here? What happened? And and for me, I'm like, no, I knew it. I knew that I was going here. You know, I had my mindset. I was speaking it into an existence. So what I wanted to ask you, like getting on that set when you were like, wow, how did, you know, the, you didn't choose the project. The project chose you. Yeah. Well, well, why do you think that it what was the re-driving force? You um, know? It started before that. I was assistant location managing a television show that was local, and there was a key PA. Her name is Lisa, and I, to this day, still tell her, like, I can't believe you got me on Captain Phillips. She was only on set for one day, and I met her for one day, and she left to go on Captain Phillips, and then she left, I think, a few days later after that to go work on Killing Lincoln, and she called me and was like, hey, I'm recommending you to do this. Do you want to come PA? I know it's not your role that you're in now, but would you be willing to do that? Because I know you can do it. And I'm like, oh, my God, yes. Sign me up. So I left a TV show at a, at a higher pay grade to go PA on a union show um, just for working with someone one day on set. That was a PA. Hmm. Terrible. So what was your, uh, like, process? Because so Captain Philip was a union. Yep. And you were like indie kind of yeah non union. Know. So this was the first. Br this was your first break. That's yeah. what we were talking about. Yeah. How did did they did you start writing your hours or for the unions or did you learn about the unions in that process as well or no? I honestly I was so excited I didn't pay attention. Mm. <laughs> no one no one really told me like to keep track of that until a little bit later on. But I think when you're and then when they told you how many days you yeah, need to keep track, it was like, like what? I, I don't wish have, I, why I have kids. Know? I'm a single mom. I can't do that. It's too many hours. I this know. is what it was. It's a lot of hours. What is it right now? It's like 500, isn't it? Five, 600 hours. Yeah, I think. Yeah, that's a lot. Young Tori can Google that for us and interject a little bit yeah. later. Um, so another question I wanted. So you grew up in a really small town. You you So the exposure to like the shows and everything that comes through town, that's why the, the print and advertising for the state of Virginia, right? Yeah. And for tourism and all that, that was kind of what was available. Uh, but... I wanted to ask you, what is, what was the first major UPM producer job for you and how did that land it? Because from when you finally had the realization that somebody believed in you and put the power in your thought that like, I can do this was your friend at the bank where like, here's a camera, go do something, yeah. make something happen. Yeah. And then you kind of stick to it. And this is, you know, what you're 22, 23, something like yeah. that. How long before you kind of you know, then there were some PA jobs, I'm assuming, in between. and Actually, I didn't. Uh, no? It was, you no. I PA? No. I don't what? know if we can be friends. You know, <laughs> well, I was young and I was starting a family. So I started going back to college around 22. Ended up at Regent when I was 26. And then um, it wasn't until from that point. So you're talking maybe 2001, 2002. Started doing film in 2010. Um, so it's, it was a long span, but where was the Academy uh, Award nominated short? In two thousand, uh, was it a feature or short? It's a short film. Short. It's uh, two thousand ten. I was in my undergrad at Regent by then. It just took me seven years to finish college because of the kids, but I finished. Incredible. Yeah, I finished. Um, so w from there, I did one PA job uh, for Fresh Express Salad, and I watched the art department put salad into this cannon gun, and they used the Phantom, so the salad was spraying out like a thousand frames a second. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I'm like geeky, I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> this is happening. so cool, yeah. <laughs> but after that, you know, the city of Virginia Beach, I worked with an ad agency that let me produce, field produce, new PM. Um, commercials for the city of Virginia Beach their come visit the beach ads you jumped the ladder a little bit yeah and my um, the professors in my school are like you're gonna be in the mail room you can't just go out there and say I'm gonna be a producer because I'm like I'm a producer that was what my role was because I'm like I already knew that's what I wanted to do and it mm -hmm. just kind of fit me and my personality but um yeah I, I did jump the role the only way I didn't jump the role was when I switched over to features I had to 
really buckle down and, and really humble myself and take in the PA roles. This is a very interesting uh, thing to me about film schools. It's like, so like the Lark, like um, Chapman or I don't know, like it's the four year, like the long program, you know, you start basically like, oh, I love film, you know, maybe today kids with iPhone and cameras everywhere. So you can kind of make, start making films, you know, as a yeah. little kid. But um, you, you kind of go from uh, basically not knowing anything, then go through film school. You have professors and all these teams of people are helping you and then you graduate, right? And you're like produced, made shorts. M some people made multiple shorts. Yeah. And then uh, a buddy of mine I had on last week, a producer that uh, Ross Campbell, uh, shout out to Ross, uh, who produced the the feature film that we just did in Vegas during pandemic. Yeah. Incredible guy. Um, he did seven shorts during his uh, what's the last year? Senior or yeah, senior, senior right? In high yeah. In college. Uh, yeah, in his film school, right? And uh, I'm sorry. And he said, um, you know, like, I don't understand how then after four years of learning and, you know, he did seven shorts, you then go into the, like, the real world and you started, you go PA. Yeah. You know, it just kind of doesn't make sense. Like, why do you go through school learning all this stuff and then kind of going back to square one? Well, I have something to add on to that. I was a office PA on a uh, CW show that came for pilot uh, for two weeks. And the UPM, they kind of kept me in the production office because the what had happened, I got hired based off of referral. Um, the Virginia Film Office would call. I got myself to a point where the Virginia Film Office called me first for a lot of stuff. And I'm like, I don't know what I did right, but something's working. So they're calling me. These shows are calling me. And so I ended up in the production office, but the different departments wanted me to work in it. They're like, you're popular but we're gonna keep you for ourselves. I'm like, cool, because I wanna be a UPM. So I went up to the UPM and I'm like, I want your job, how do I do it? And she's like, forget everything you learned in film school, I'm gonna show you. And that's exactly what she and the production office staff did. And I really respect her for that because I was willing to learn. I was willing to unlearn the bad habits I learned from film school. And she just really, that's when I really started learning about unions. And I was like, mm -hmm. oh, there's a whole other level out there I need to work towards. So surround yourself with good mentors yes and it seems that's like you got important. pretty you had some very really good female uh role yeah. model as a in, in the position that you were aspiring to, to get into it, yep how did how did she uh approach her mentorship but you like she was like i get what you want i'm gonna share and i'm gonna yeah and 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 that's pretty much what it's been for me like she was like you know i'm gonna give you some pearls like pay it forward, I'm gonna help you. And that's exactly what she gave me. And then um, I have another UPM mentor now, uh, her name is Karen Jarnicki, and um, she's a production supervisor for the DC movies. I mean, you can IMDb her, she's a sweetheart. I met her on a Hulu show. And um, she, I just like, I knew she was a production manager because we need to have a keen sense of who's what in the world when you're in the set so long. And she uh, was teaching me how to do next level budgets. And we went and she's like, I'm gonna show you how to go to that next level. And she's like, you can't do this level anymore. But uh, the UPMs that I've met even on the CBS lot, they have really like sat down and had conversations with me and it's made my friends insanely jealous because they don't usually give people time. And I'm oh. just sitting here and I'm like really grateful for them taking me, you know, under their wing and really showing me because we, you know, we we're trying to get me into the DGA because I've been UPMing for so long. And because like my hours in Virginia weren't rolling over. Um, so that they're like, you can't go back to PA and you've worked too hard too for so hard. long. Yeah, you can't go back. So we're, we're like, there's this whole plan now of how I can get. That's funny, right? The zones of the unions as well, right? Yeah. Like where certain hours do count. So like, ADing, for example, um, like if you're if you're gonna AD f first assistant director uh, in 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 LA, it's almost better to start here. Um, like I have friends that were ADs first ADs in like Hawaii or the outside LA zone. And they come in here and yeah. they can't be a first AD. They have like don't they get downgraded or yeah. I have friends that have been hired, flew over, and then they found out like oh you're in this t we can't actually. It's yeah. still funny, right? It, it's interesting, too, because I went to Sundance, and I don't know, Brian, again, I don't know how I landed this luxury party because I didn't register for it. It was so fancy, <laughs> and I didn't know. Well, you fancy. I, well, I didn't know it was that 
for like faux fur, or like elegant glam, like super Hollywood fancy. You know what? Somebody probably thought, oh, that's Tina Fey. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> that's what it was. Somebody maybe. was like, that's Tina Fey. We're not going to ask her. But so so <laughs> my friends were like, jealous. Come on in, Tina. My friends were jealous that I got this party. And I'm like, I don't know. You know, I'm just like very down to earth. So I'm going in like my Uggs and my REI because it's like Utah in January. It's freezing. And they were so fancy, Brian. I remember standing there and. And I'm like, oh, my God, I can't go in there because I don't fit in. Like, I didn't fit in. And this guy was handing out these super fancy cigars that I don't smoke. But so he gave me one. He's like, are you okay? I'm like, look at me. I don't fit in. Like, look at my clothes. Nothing I'm wearing says I'm on, like, I'm supposed to be in this party. And he's like, I don't know you, but you were born to stand out and you're going to be just fine. And he was very encouraging to me. And I, I went in that party and like I actually had some really cool encounters with high prolific Hollywood people that, again, gave me some really good pearls of wisdom. They're like, you know, you're a good person. And I guess because I was very authentic mm -hmm. of like it was kind of like pretty women minus the whole stripper thing, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 but but I was real and, and authentic and they just really just gave me some really good advice and you know and to this day like i'm that person if someone is in my shoes i will help them you know mean meanwhile five minutes later he goes to his buddy he's like you're not gonna believe what tina fey just <laughs> told me <laughs> probably so <laughs> it's like so i gave her you know a little <laughs> but it, but that's the experiences i've had you know and and ones that i'm really grateful for because it's not like that for everybody yeah Last question about the Virginia uh, area, East Coast. What's the major difference, in your opinion, about that in Hollywood? Like the Hollywood filmmaking here now in L.A.? Because you have both experiences, so I think it would be great. You you worked professionally on the East Coast in a small town, came from a small town, and then now here you are in L.A. where we have literally hundreds of thousands. And I don't even want to say 10,000 because it really probably in L.A. is hundreds of thousands yeah. in the industry competing in for gigs jobs opportunities networking um know, so virginia is very southern home hospitality so when you go and film there you're going to get these down-to-earth people who make you feel like you're at home it's that southern hospitality you know and they're hard workers um but there's a there's a certain level where it kind of caps a little bit where there's just like there's no more growth but when those union shows come, they get hired on for that and people enjoy working with them like because we're just very, you know, very friendly, real, authentic people. You're going to have those that are like not that way. It's like that anywhere. But, you know, coming to L.A., you have that. I mean, it's like next level professionalism. It's like you're not in Kansas anymore. You got to step up your game if you want to go play with the big boys. I mean, and really you have to and you have to be careful because you have to find the right group to go work with. You know what I mean? Um, but I, I've enjoyed working on both coasts and I miss my 757 family a lot. They know that. I mean, I'm grateful for the jobs I've had with them and the growth and the foundation, but now it's, there's so much more I can offer. And that's why I moved to LA because I knew like, that's the level I want to be at. Like I, I'm, that's what I'm working towards. I think I know what you mean. I, I feel like there's a certain standard and level to LA almost like every yeah. music video now I'm working on is other shot on the Alexa LF. Yeah you know, or the minute LF or like red yeah. or I was shooting with like the, just the, the, the level of quality of the gear and, you know, all the DPs and people that I know in the industry and like own some of this gear. And I'm like, wow. Yeah. Like it just, it's, it's a whole nother standard here. You it know, it is. And I worked with, and I can't say who the client was. I worked with a, a high end fortune 500 company that came in to Williamsburg and this is what that igniter to come back to LA and they were like, why are you here? You need to be back in Los Angeles. And I'm like, oh, I can't raise my babies in LA. Like, I just don't feel comfortable because like, you know, Virginia is a great place to raise a family. Um, but they're like, you have so much potential and you're not using it here. Mm. And that's coming from like the absolute top producer. And so I'm like, okay, let me talk to my mentor and figure out like, can I do this? Am I willing to sacrifice this move for my kids? Because it, it was, I knew it was time, but it's risky because you don't know when you get here, like if you're going to make it or if you're going to have to go back home. That's a tough one, right? Yeah, it's a hard one, especially with kids. Like I'm like, I don't have a lot of help with them, even as now a teenager. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to figure out how to make this work if I'm going to take this leap of faith. But when I got here, 
it was very rewarding for me. It wasn't, it wasn't like, oh, I'm in the making all this money. It was more like the doors were opening. I'm in the right place at the right time. You know, it wasn't just film being on set. It was also like, okay, now I'm modeling. Now I'm acting or I'm doing feature background work. It was like, okay, let me just keep. You'll do whatever it takes, whatever it takes to survive, to make it, break it, network. Yeah. And yeah. that, and it's like this switch flips for me when I'm away from my children. Like it's every moment when I'm away from them counts. I can't waste it. So that lights a never like a different level fire under me to make it like these moments have to count for me because it's Something. time away from my kids. Absolutely. Well, yeah. you're an amazing mom. I'm trying. I don't know. I'm not perfect, but you nobody know. is. <laughs> nobody is. But I think you're doing an amazing job. They're good kids. I have good ones. How old? Are They're kids 15 and 16. Right. So. Wow. So they were really young when you were like getting into the industry. Yeah. Mm. They're very familiar with all the shows and like one of them. I, you know, like, I think we talked about it briefly, like I, I've, it was been a struggle because I've had to let go of opportunities that I couldn't take because I had no childcare. Um, you know, I, and if the job wasn't enough to cover childcare, I mm -hmm. couldn't, I couldn't take it because I just didn't have that support system or the help I needed to continue. So it was like, I had a lot of side hustles and when the jobs came that I could do with my kids, then I would, I would do them. What would, well, yeah, the film industry, you know, the hours that we work are insane as it is yeah. for anybody, yeah. let alone uh, a single mom with two kids. Yep. So, you know, talk about that. How was that? It was hard. I've, I've had shows that were very, um, because I worked really hard, help me out a little bit and be a little more flexible. Like um, the CW show I worked on, and this isn't for everybody, and this is definitely not gloating. Like I don't know why they did this for me, okay? They, my kids were going on spring break, and I'm like, look, I have to leave the show. I don't have child care. And the UPM, the coordinator, like, we don't want to lose you. I'm like, they're like, how are your kids good? I'm like, they're very well behaved. They're used to being on set. And they're like, we can bring them with you. We'll just have you do runs with them in the car. And I'm like, okay, let me see if I can have their dad after work pick them up so I can still work. And so they let me bring the kids to set for some amount of time because sets are 12 hour craziness, yeah, right? Yeah. And then, you know, the kids were, and then when I would do my runs, so they weren't always on set, but they would, you know, they went and, you know, kids like crafty, they would raid the crafty table and then they would actually watch the shot getting set up and like watching the stars in their eyes was like really cool. But that was the first show that would let me bring them with me. And like, that doesn't happen. And it made a lot of people angry at me, but I'm like, I don't know what I did to deserve that but I was going to have to let my job go because I didn't have mm -hmm. childcare. Have you, would you, so that was going to lead me to my next question, which is uh, wh how do you feel that the industry is towards, uh, you know, mothers and, and women in general in terms of supporting them uh, throughout, you know, when you go have a kid, you're in working professional in the industry. Do you, and, and kind of like over the last 10 years, have you seen an improvement? Is, is it becoming something that the studios, the producers or the, 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 the gigs are more, you know, I think now it's a, it's gotten a lot better than it was when I was starting out. Mm -hmm. When I was starting out, it was a little, a little different because it was, you're not going to be able to give me the time we need for you. Cause you have two kids. And I'm like, okay, I understand. I respect that, but at least let me try. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I have the fire and the motivation to make it happen, but at least let me figure out myself if I can juggle that. Don't make that decision for me. But now I, th I feel like there's a lot more grace for us um, to work because I know like if my son is sick, I'm like, I have to go take care of my kid. Mm -hmm. Like, because the relationships I built up and, and like the referrals and rec you know, and all that recommendations, like they know that, okay, April has got to take care of kids. She's going to come back. You know what I mean? It's, it's not like you're going to lose your job anymore. So did you ever hit it? Did you ever for a job? You were like, I'm just not even going to tell them I have kids. I've tried, but it, it, they still find out you have children. Like on captain Phillips, you know, they didn't know I had kids. I'm like, Oh, I got to go see my son. I'm going to make sure I get home before the and they're like, Oh, you have kids. Do you want to go home early and go see your kids? And I was like, are you serious? <laughs> So oh yeah, one of the one of the seconds let me go home and get put my kids to bed. So it was really nice of them. How long you were on the Captain Phillips? That was two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah, that's how long they were in Virginia. Mm. What was the part that they were shooting in Virginia? Um, but the battleships because they were it's a major naval station. So like one of the ships. I'm sure I'm saying it wrong. Oh no 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 yeah. So when the, the is it when the Navy SEALs are gonna yeah. execute the kill on the the lifeboat. Yeah. When he's yeah when they're on the battle. By the way, the, the Captain Phillips. What a movie! Like yeah. it's just the story and it was handheld. I was like, oh, I'm so geeking out right now. Was April by the by the end of it, did you look at Tom Hanks and say, "Look, 
I'm the captain now. No. <laughs> <laughs> Look at me. No. Look at me. But he was a really nice guy to work with. I I enjoyed it. I'm the captain. <laughs> <laughs> I did talk to the pirates though. They're really nice guys. Yeah, uh, the guy that got nominated. Yeah, he's a really nice guy. I chatted with them a little bit. What's his name? Tori, find out for us. I, I remember the guy. Like, I, I want to give him a shout out. He's such a great. He was such a great actor. And I didn't know, like honestly, I I didn't know I wasn't allowed to talk to them because I didn't know like what the rules are. Yeah, I didn't know what the rules were at the time, and I'm like, oh, there's rules. I'm sorry, I didn't mean. There is right. Isn't it weird? All these yeah. like, different rules of set. Yeah, but I mean, it, it worked out. Everybody knew I was really green. They were just kind of like navigating me towards doing the right thing. So I was just like, la la, having a good time. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's a nice guy. Bacardi Abdi. Yeah, I chatted with him. And, Fuck, and man. I hope I didn't butcher your name. Yeah, he was really, he's a sweetheart. He really was. He's or been is. A lot. Yeah, 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 he's been, well, once you get an Academy, Academy Award nomination, I think uh, doors open up. Right, April? Yes, they do. <laughs> So, um, relationships, producers, directors, any horror stories, anything? We've talked a little bit yesterday, and you told me you've been actually having, you know, pretty uh, pretty good experiences o o overall. Yeah, in I, I've been very fortunate in my in my in the industry since I've been in there. Um, I mean, I, I've seen if recently I've had more issues with the women producers, um, and I don't know if it's because they had to fight so hard to get into that position or if it's just like a clashing of personalities. But, um, I mean, and there's no disrespect. I, I really do. And I think as, as women filmmakers, it's important to lift each other up, not tear each other down. So, um, you know, that's why I was so surprised when you told me, I was like, I expected at least one or two assholes producers, you know, because I mean, I, I've seen, you know, I've seen it all, but, um, you were like, Nope. I had all a great experience with m male producers. I have. And then you're like, I've actually had worked with some terrible, terrible female producers that were so mean and, um, and you yeah. just a toxic environment. I was like, I want to know more. I, I, and I honestly, I respect them enough. Like, I'm not going to diverge yeah, no, 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 stuff. No. But um, I don't know what it is. But I, I just, like, know that I, if you need help, I'll help you. But we're going to have some healthy boundaries now because um, I think it's important that we lift each other up, mm -hmm. especially like now and um, just continue to stay positive because it's hard. It's hard for women to have our leadership roles. It, it is. And it's hard for people to take us seriously at times. And I understand like the walls need to go up to have that commanding presence. But I also know like when you need to let go a little bit and just let your crew do support each other yeah help each other lift each other up yeah exactly and and i'm very much a, a positive person like that and um but sometimes it might just be the personality clashes like you know i, I don't know it, it was just a very unique experience i know my professor in my undergrad she um she was really hard on me and she says you have a lot of potential and she like failed me on a paper because i forgot to put a period or something on there because it's like she's like your first thing you're gonna get when you're UPMing and producing is if your paperwork's not done correctly you're gonna have a lawsuit that was my introduction into producing she gave me an F wow yeah that's why I like paper now I'm, <laughs> I'm assuming that's probably why I like paper now <laughs> she was really hard on me all right so directors and like UPM who are you close I would say probably first AD Maybe like the closest relationship, like the most important relationship that you're kind of balancing. Yeah, I would set. say I would say the AD and the producers, but on set it's definitely the AD. Uh, I like working with the ADs. I have so much respect for them. Any uh, any kind of uh, tips or tricks or any kind of you know how do you establish the relationship? I think a lot of open communication um, that helps out a lot, and and just understanding the individual if you're if you haven't worked with them before like get to know them know how they work because you want to work well with them not be against them because mm -hmm. they're your they're your ally on set and to, to work alongside with you to make sure we're making our day so definitely make friends with them don't make an enemy with them get to know them um because you you want to establish that rapport so your show ends up you know positive you know what i mean like a good a good vibe Throughout the shoot or the day, do you go and kind of check in with your AD and just like, where are we at? Yeah, I do. I do, and I bug them, and then I play. <laughs> it's usually what I end up doing. Well, yeah. I, I like I like to play on set, and I and I know that sounds silly, but I just – I'm one of those people, like, I'm really happy to be doing what I love to do because it's not often we can say that we love to do – you know, we're, like, doing something that we love doing. Yeah. You know, and I, and I enjoy my 80s, like, my – 
James is the AD of mine, and I love working with him. He's so entertaining. I'm like, man, you just make me laugh all day long, but I let him do his job. I give him the room to do his job because that's what he's there to do, you know. And well, how about directors? Uh, well, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes they're fun and sometimes they're difficult. But um, As any creatives. Yeah, really. b- but I understand, and I'm on board with their vision. Like, I get it, but I- you really have to wrangle them in sometimes. Um, but I haven't had any super diva directors that I've had to work with as a UPM. Not yet, but I, I know, you know, it'll come at some point in my, in my journey, but Mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've been very, again, fortunate to have ones that are like, okay, let me work past the personality. I understand it's a creative vision. Like, let me just let them do their thing and I'll do my thing and it's all good. I think it's important to establish the line with your director coming from me as a, as a first AD, now also transitioning into directing, done some producing, to establish the line of what is it that you want versus what is it that you need. Exactly. You have to, because then they'll go over budget. Right. Well, and not, not even like for me, time-wise and, and blocking the actors and everything, I'm like, okay, yes, this yeah. would be ideal for you to get all these angles and all these take. I mean, yeah. you know, when you're in a $50, $100 million movie, nobody cares. Yeah. You know. You gotta well, get, you at some point, s- people do start care, but like you, you shoot a scene for two or three days sometimes, you know, and it's like, wow. All right. Yeah. 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 And when you get one, when you get then when you get it all dialed in and you're kind of just like, all right, well, that's do your I, thing. I think that's why it's helpful having a shot list. You know what I mean? Like some oh, directors don't have a shot list and I'm like, OK, no one knows what's going on. We can't plan the day. It's going to be so helpful knowing like what's needed to capture the picture. Yeah, I almost feel like some directors do that on purpose. Yeah. To kind of like, so they can, they, you know, get more. Yeah. I like storyboards. I like to lay it out and plan out everything and kind of visually have it prepared. And It helps. It helps plan the day better. I like doing concept art even from oh, yeah, their really early beginning of outline of stories and everything. Yeah. You start to visually support what you're creating. Yeah. Because then you might see something and it's like, wow, that's cool. Yeah. That could be part of the story. Yeah. That could be, a, you know, or that tool, that, that, uh, you know, uh, you know, the sci-fi that I'm working on, that exoskeleton now becomes basically a character. Yeah. And it's like, well, I didn't know that until we concept did some art and, and some sketches, it. looked at it. Yeah. But um, so closest relationship with your first AD, with your first ADs, do you uh, usually pick your first ADs or do you mostly come on, an on, on shoot and they were already on board with the, you know? I uh, honestly, they always hire me after they hire the AD. Um, so it's like, <laughs> that's, the, that's been my, my path, but, um, that's okay because I've, I'm very, you know, very friendly and approachable and I just go and introduce myself to my team and, you know, let the relationship build. Can you just grab some water? You good? You want my water? Uh, I, more would be great cause I'm probably going to finish this pretty quickly, but yeah, you know, I, I really, I like my eighties. They're awesome. I haven't had any issues. Well, with the I, 80s. I'm very grateful that. You spared me of the last shoot you were on. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, Brian, I'm so glad that this wasn't the one we worked on together. Because yeah, you probably wouldn't have wanted to work with me anymore after that. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> but um, but as far as like you want to talk about missed opportunity, um, as, a, as a working mom, you know, I had an internship at Universal in the post-production and I had to turn it down because it wasn't paying because I couldn't take care of my family. You would think Universal would pay, right? Yeah, that one was non-paying, and I, I couldn't do it. Are they uh, in the union? Is there any kind of child care or any kind of uh, anything? Or I don't I don't know, but I was happy that that once in a lifetime opportunity came to me. But like, I am not ever going to sacrifice my family for a job. Like, I'm not going to do it because I I really value being a mom and like my kids are my responsibility. You know what I mean? I want to make sure I'm there for them. Even now it's like, okay, I'm not going to, you know, I can travel now because they're older and Mm -hmm. and apparently when you're teenagers, it's not cool to be around your parents anyway. (laughs) But, but, you know, I I just wouldn't at the time when they're so young, I'm like, I'm just not, not going to do that. And it was just took me a lot longer to get to where I'm at, but that's okay because I think everyone has these decisions that we're presented with, but I chose my family. As you, as you should. Yeah. I agree. But, um, well, let's say there is a single mother, mother, sorry, out there listening. You've been now doing this, you've done this for 10 years. Yep. What are some of the 
tips, tricks, or something, you know, that you could like, hey, I've I've worked around this way. Or I was able to do it this way. What are some good, um, you know, measures to to make the already crazy schedule of filmmaking work? Um, I would say try really hard not to feel guilty. Um, mom's guilt is a real thing, and um, I still have it sometimes, you know, with my kids. And um, don't feel guilty. Your kids love you. You love your children, and just keep that in focus. And know, that, like, like I said, the moments you're away from them make them count. And um, you have a solid support system, someone, people that you can trust. So if you get a gig last minute, you can have someone tag team the kids with you, so you know they're safe and they're doing their homework. You know, because mine were really young when I was starting, so like, childcare was a really big thing for me. Um, and don't give up because there are days where you just want to cry because you want it so bad, but then you go home and look at your kids and you're like, okay, it's gonna be fine. Like you can't give up because it, there are moments where some of the jobs you have to pass on because your kids are gonna come first. Like they, they have to come first, but it's okay because they're not little ones for long. Enjoy the moments when they're small, but have that support system. Like that support system is so key to allowing you to have a little more wiggle room to go play and like, you know, what also saved me is having a side hustle. Like I've had, you know, I've worked at Kohl's, I sold shoes, that's why I need a shoe size. Um, <laughs> uh, my favorite side hustle, I worked at Disneyland and I was a photographer there and it was probably like, they did a really good job fostering my creativity. Did you get, um, did you get like for your kids, like a free pass to Disneyland or something? Yeah, we get comp tickets and main entry passes. So, you know, my kids, my kids are tired of Disney right now. They don't want to go. <laughs> <laughs> they like grew up in Disneyland. <laughs> they did. And, but that was my favorite side hustle. And my department was really good to me. I don't know who would complain about working in Disneyland. Well, I was embarrassed at first because I'm like, I want to be a serious filmmaker. And uh, here obviously I am taking photos of people in Disneyland. Right. And, but when you're indie and you're trying to get out of the indie environment into like, you know, we're talking about being on that consistent Captain Phillips level, like how does that happen? It it it's a it's a journey, and you know when you're raising your kids by yourself, and you know you have sometimes have help, sometimes you don't. You're trying to figure out, okay, am I doing the right thing? Because I would tell you, I would give up everything for them. Like I would walk away from it if they asked me to. But my kids have been so cool about it. They're like, no, mom, you are so happy when you're on set. Like keep making your movies. You know what I mean? Like they just they're very. They're very cool children. So, you know, like. That's incredible. So, so amazing support system from your is, kids. Is key. Yeah, my kids have been very supportive. They see the love that you have for it and they they pass it along back to you. Yeah. So mom, now go ahead and do this. They, yeah, when uh, COVID hit, my um, daughter asked me to let her go because she was struggling out here, go back to her Because they fucking canceled all the school and everything, right? It and was then, hard. Like, doing yeah. Zoom calls. I'm like, well, I can do that from anywhere. I can't go anywhere in, in LA. Yeah. You can't do anything. So, you know, she, she asked me to let her go and I sat there and I was crying because I worked really hard to get them here. And I remember that, <laughs> so I told you I might cry when I say this, I was in the airport <laughs> and um, my son's like, mom, you have to make your movies. We're going to be okay. Because he asked me to let him go back to the dad. So that was really hard. Cause, like, your son was out here too? Yeah, for a little bit. And so um, but he's like really smart and he needs to be challenged. So, um, but they've been like really, really good to me. And Supportive. Yeah, I'm sorry I'm crying. but No, you're fine. I just love my kids. They just like. I can tell. I think everybody can. Yeah. So, you know, um, I'm very fortunate that I have them. Yeah. You did. This sounds like you've done an incredible job. Yeah. And you have a great support team. You Turns out my kids are my best support system. Yep. Well, <laughs> they're you, <laughs> right? Yeah. They, they were raised by you. So. So now I have one that wants to be an animator and one wants to be a doctor. Hmm. Right. Very opposite. How does, how does the one that wanted to be a doctor feel about the whole COVID situation? Uh, I don't know. He misses his friends. He's my social butterfly. So he rides his bike to go hang with his mm. friends and do his social things. But now that they're in school two days a week, um, the kids are still separated. Like they can't eat lunch with anybody. They have to eat alone. So it's like really lonely. And I just feel really bad for them. Uh, but he just doesn't like it. I don't think people quite understand the level of sacrifice that you probably had to deal with, like let alone how hard it is to get into the industry, work in the industry and get opportunities presented to you and then have something else um, 
that you know you can control be like no i'm gonna you know it, there's something i want to do i love to do but you know i love my children i want to spend time with my children i'm not gonna so what was the number do you remember was it the universal gig that was probably the number one kind of a disappointment to you that you weren't able to take on and i know i love the decision you made obviously there was no no other choice but yeah that was hard that was probably the one that and what was it what were you going to do in universal what I was, was the job a offer a post pa wow Okay. I could have worked my way up to yep. post producer, yeah, and that's yeah, a pretty cl quick ladder. And they, yeah, he said that like the guy who offered it to me, like you are so driven, you are going to move up. Was probably within the first year to be a post producer. Did, have you reached out back? Uh, I have, but I haven't heard back. You know what I mean? That's okay. You know, it's the industry. Yep, things you know, move. Yeah, I I, I respect take, that. Yeah, you know what I mean? Shift. So, but you know, it is what it is. It's just what my path was. You know. Yeah, I'm really, really impressed how you handled the everything that you had to deal with. It's an incredible story. I love uh, I love hearing it, and I'm I'm looking forward to working with you so much. Oh, I know, I can't wait. I'm excited too. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm like, ooh, paperwork. I'm so ready. Please sign me up. Oh, uh, I want you to be more than you know. <laughs> yeah, I know. I no, and <laughs> I want you out of that production trailer and be like, on the set. I have a really good energy, I've been told, and I think that's another reason why I get hired a lot is my uh, my energy and positive attitude, you know what I mean? And, and just, you know, it's like I really, because I had to make choices, and I'm just like, the ones I get, I'm just really, you think they're good or if they're, they're growing opportunities, as I call the bad ones, you know, that's a positive way of putting it. Like, there's always something to take away, and it could all be gone in a moment, so what are you going to do even with this bad one? That kind of was the situation with the COVID, right? Yeah. And so I wanted to talk to you about that. I was like, here we are, gig workers. We were <laughs> it's almost always like waiting for the next phone call, right? You finish something, and as you're finishing up, you're like, I can't believe it's ending. But at the same time, you're like, I'm wondering what the next phone call was going to be for. Because we're like, well, unless you get on a... So I went through the TV channels, right? Like, yeah. So for me, it's like once you get on a show, usually unless you really fuck things up majorly you stay on and if this show gets picked up you know so tv is quite different than um uh, than film uh you know yeah uh, but um what was 2020 like for you the the whole process when did you when did it first kind of hit like oh shit this is gonna really um i was well the last gig i got be right before covid i was doing um slow county tourism ads that actually just aired which I can share with you, and it's dope. I was like, yes, there's my wine country stuff. <laughs> I really, I, I get really geeky and excited when my stuff airs because it's like, I can, you work hard and this, it's on TV, and it's like, yay, my stuff's on it's TV. It's real. It's really real. <laughs> it doesn't ever get old. It's like the coolest thing ever. But, um, but I was at Disney, and you know, I was still recovering from my my shoulder um, being injured, and uh, I didn't have. Um, a gig yet like because COVID hit in March and my last day at Disney was March 7th mm -hmm. and I, I'm like I'm gonna treat it like a freelance gig that was where my mind went because I'm like I'm gonna treat it like I'm just waiting for the next gig mm -hmm. but COVID didn't go away <laughs> so um for me do you remember the March April time when people were like we're gonna do that two-week lockdown do you remember that like yeah. well I guess we're gonna do this like two-week three-week lockdown and and we'll see how things go and hopefully then there in was a like month. And then no was toilet paper, no paper towels. And like, because I'm, you know, I'm in Irvine. So I'm like, there's nothing around. So like my friends from Disney were trying to help me find food for my kid. You know what I mean? So I'm like, they were like, okay, I'm going to Walmart. I'm going to see if I can find stuff for you and Tori. And they were like finding me groceries that I needed to survive because you couldn't find anything. You couldn't find meat. You couldn't find paper products. You know what I mean? So like they would go, they would go because in some cities you had more food than other cities. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I can't, I couldn't go out because I'm high risk. So I mean, so it was, it was very, it was challenging for a while. Was it high risk due to the surgery? No, I have asthma, and mm. um, the Silverado fire uh, was gave me my first asthma attack in like eight years. So I don't know what it'll do to my lungs. So I'm, I just have to be very careful. Yeah. What was your first gig during the pandemic? Uh, I ha actually have an NDA, so I can't say what it, the brand is, but I had a, I had a commercial ad campaign um, in October. Uh, so that was the first one. And then after that, I got uh, a short film. And then after that, I worked on a double feature with Tasca Musk, Elon Musk's sister, uh, on her stuff. And I really, like, she 
as a director, I, I sat back and I'm like, I love watching this. It reminded me of Captain Phillips. Like she's just like with a DP watching all this magic unfold. And it was like a really cool experience. Yeah. You told me about it. Yeah. Um, she's how really was she worked with? She was a really good eye. Like I really admired everything that she was doing on set. You know what I mean? She did a good job. And I was like, I like, I remember like the last day I was like, thank you for bringing me on board. Like I had a really good time. I think it just took a while for all the production people to figure it out how we gonna make movies and with this like do new protocols yeah safety is important safety yeah the covid the covid compliance is huge and i'm very much a stickler for it and some of the indie ones aren't fully following covid protocol and it bothers me because you like if one person gets it shuts down the whole thing it really does yeah. so you know i'm like okay everybody's gotta get their covid tests you know what I mean? Like every other day on set and the uh, pods, the working pods and the food, you know. I know. As yeah. if it wasn't enough in the independent film, like if it was as if it wasn't hard enough, right, yeah. to make an independent film. And then uh, so we were doing this movie in Vegas um, and Vegas has been so g they've been so good to us. Yeah. But like all the things that I had to do as a uh, 80 and then now like. Okay, like you gotta draw the safety maps for the COVID and health and safety and like all these things like score footages and who can be in what rooms and what's the hot zone, the red zone and the, the yeah. you know and the wristbands and, and wristbands are important. <coughs> yeah. And the face shields and the K ninety fives. Yeah, I have two certifications in COVID compliance and there's one more in risk management that's done out of the UK that I wanna take because I wanna understand what the measures are as far as whole production as a whole. Because as a UPM, like, you really need to understand, like, all the nuances to, like, where this is all going to happen if something happens, you know. What's next for you? Your stuff. My stuff? <laughs> Your stuff. <laughs> um, but I have a short film this week coming up. It's one day. So I'll, I'll do that. And then um, whatever comes, comes, you know, I just wrap TK2 as a coordinator. Uh, they brought me on as two roles for that show. So, like, that was a really good experience. TK2. Yeah, Tiger King 2. Yeah, let's just be... <laughs> is that like official that they <clears throat> has that been officially announced that they are filming season two no i didn't even know they were um mm -hmm. i got that one through facebook by the way like that show and they found me on facebook and i interviewed a couple times with the production manager and the other producer and they really like you're overqualified i'm like yeah but right now i just want to work because it's been covid mm -hmm. so i brought i came in and I was geeking out over doing insurance forms and booking picture cars <laughs> and you know like I have like this I'm in my sweet spot this is great you know <laughs> nice. but but it was a really like I just worked really well with the team you know and I'm like I can't wait for the next one but yeah did you watch the first season I did it was crazy I'm st every, yeah I know everybody there was that big you know uh, what do you call it there was that big like Tiger King Tiger King. everybody yeah. was talking about Tiger King I'm like I watched like the first episode or the second and I was like, I don't know what everybody's like tripping. Do I need to finish? Do yeah. I need to watch the whole thing? You should. It's interesting. Um, right. But it's, uh, it's, it's a second like nine hour, 10 hour commitment. Right. So yeah, I'm like, I know you're busy. <clears throat> I don't know if I want to give this thing. But as far as what's next, I kind of go with the flow. You know, what comes when it comes and you can't force it. You know that. Yep. You can't force it. But yeah, so it's been it's been a good ride. It's been a really good ride for me. And, you know, just knowing my kids are there, my little sports system. So it's just been they're such good kids. Um, anything larger, anything big project coming up or anything on the horizon? Well, I've been trying to get my feature off the ground and I got my first angel investor. It's a family drama. Um, so I want to do that. Did you wrote it? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I've been working. Did you ever wrote anything before? This was a COVID driven, like, well, I have time on my hands. Well, so the history, it's called Evangeline. The history of this film, my grandfather actually died three years ago this month. And before he passed, um, he was so proud of me because of Captain Phillips. He's like, granddaughter, you really made it. He's like, I'm so proud <laughs> of you, you know? And it's like, I was just a PA, but for him, that was his favorite actor. That was my first feature. And that really put in perspective to my for my family, like this thing's really real for me. And didn't matter the other stuff, I don't think, but this particular one was like the big break for them. Mm -hmm. And he was telling me, you know, cause they always give like their last like life lessons as they're on their way out. And um, it was two days before he died. And he, I might cry for this one too. 
because I have such a special relationship with my grandfather. How he old? Uh, what well, old is your grandfather? He's he ninety four. Oh shit! So he survived. So he had an incredible life. He did. He wasn't perfect, but his outlook was like amazing. Was he all there until the last? Uh, yeah, he well was. That's you really can't wish for any much more than you know. Yeah. Because I now have some. I have been talking to a couple of friends that have their uh, you know grandparents and parents, and they are dealing with. You know when they can't remember remember their name. Yeah, he I can't imagine going. He through that. survived World War Two. He survived a widowmaker heart attack uh, and malaria and polio, and he knew. And and this is because I think the trauma of World War Two. Like I rem- like I very for I have his stories. Like he let me record his stories from the war, and I sent mm-hmm. it to the Library of Congress because there's not a lot in the South Pacific. And when he was ready to actually talk about it, he was supporting my film career, so he let me interview him with my grandmother and so I have all of the stories and like the stuff that happened over there and it was it's a credit I'll share it with you it's a really incredible documentary and um he was like he knew he was gonna die in World War II because he had this premonition because he was very spiritual he's Catholic about when he was gonna die he was gonna be on a bed with nuns with habits around him and there's no <laughs> nuns with habits there it's the war so he held on to that but when he was dying three years ago my grandmother and him had the nuns with habits come in and pray with him and he's like oh i'm dying now um but he uh he talked to me and my family knows this and he so proud of me because i worked with tom hanks and thought that that was my big break and um i didn't tell him like you know the whole like structure of how hard it is to work up the ladder but he's like promise me granddaughter that you're gonna make a good movie for me and that was our last promise, so that's why I've been working on this one. Work. Is it? Is he in the story? No, but it's about bringing family back together because that's what he wanted me to do. So that's why I wrote it for him. Were you guys really close? Yeah, he's good people. Not perfect, but his what did what did he do? What did your grandfather do for him? He cleaned pools of celebrities for a living. He was a pool cleaner. He owned his own pool business. He has a lot of stories about that too. So I have a lot of stories about Frank Sinatra and all these people from back in the heyday. So you know, wow. yeah, he was. Just, but my grandfather, he had a really like outgoing personality, and he was a ladies' man. Like the women just <laughs> loved him, and you know, to this day, and my family will laugh at this. Everybody was obsessed with his legs. My grandfather had legs of a sixteen-year-old teenage girl. Like they had no hair, and they were like really pretty. And even when he was dying. The nurses are like, gosh, you have such nice legs, Louis. Like, everybody wanted his legs, and we're all hoping that we inherited his <laughs> youthful <laughs> legs because he had really nice legs. But but he he was a ladies' man, but he was married to my grandmother from the 40s, and they've been married up until he passed. Yeah. Nice. I'm glad you have such a good memory. And he, is, he lived 94 years old. Yeah, he lived a good one. He had a good run. I mean, and he, just like – his pearls of wisdom like he would give me and my brothers you know he was just a really good guy i mean not perfect but from what i experienced my grandfather and my grandmother like i have such a unique special bond with them and like i have so much respect for them and like you know i'm really close to my grandmother and there's nothing i wouldn't do for them and honor them you know what i mean because it's just like i really value family so this feature film that you're working on is kind of for him yeah it's our promise when did you uh, when did you start working on it three years ago right after he died so it's just like I it needs like a dialogue writer so I'm working you know it's been a lot of restructuring and now that I have my first thousand dollars for it it's it makes me feel like it's more tangible now hmm. it's hard it's a good story it's very simple coming of age story you know it's a journey of this actor you know this girl who has a rough relationship with her father and she runs away for 10 years and has to come back because she like she's don't give it away I'm not, but that's all I'm going to say. So, you know, it's just one of those stories. That sounds like an interesting story. Yeah, it's a good one. It's yeah, it you, gra- need a, you need an AD to let me know. Well, of course. I mean... It you need a second AD to let me know. Is that, is <laughs> it, it's how you bring your team together. Yeah, absolutely. But it's a good story, and it keeps grabbing people because it's so relatable to what we live through. What, uh, what uh, like, draft level uh, are you on? Probably, like, 15. Draft number 15? Yeah, I just wow. go back and rewrite it. Go back and rewrite it. Are you doing all of it, all of the work by yourself? No, I have a friend of mine. Uh, her name is Jillian, and she came in last October and decided I'm going to help you because she, you know, she was working at Disney and you know she was part of the layoffs like everybody else was. And um, she's like, I like the story, but we need to restructure it. And she comes from a theater background, um, but 15 years of senior leadership at Disney and has a theater background because her mom was in the theater and costumes. So she's got a lot of handle of like the entertainment industry on some capacity. 
And so she came in and we're like, okay, the story needs to be restructured. So we started working on the restructuring of the story and it's really took it to a whole other level because when you're in it for so long by yourself, you can't figure out like what needs to be fixed. Did COVID allow for some more time spent on, spend on it? Yeah, it did. And it's in a really good place right now. So now I'm at a point where, okay, I need a dialogue writer because I've learned I'm not a dialogue writer. I think if anything people can take from COVID is there were a lot of time that was um, given back to us to like everybody because everybody had to slow down. Everybody was kind of shut down. Nobody was doing yeah. anything. So um, that uh, connection with like, oh, I've been wanting to do this and I've been putting it off for so long. Yeah. Now I, I guess, have the time to do it. Really no excuse because I can't go there. I can't do this. And you can't you know. run from it. You got to run there from and it. Yeah. Exactly. And, and face it. Yeah, face it, it, it did. It's like a reset button. Makes you focus on what's more important, you know, in your life and things that you need to let go internally. Like for me, it was a lot of internal letting go of things. And I did, uh, I did another commercial from a COVID friendly, like I did B roll and stuff because everybody kept getting bad news. And I'm like, I'm so sick of all this bad news. I need to do something positive. So I made a commercial, mm -hmm. and that won a few awards in the commercial circuit too. And then, um, oh, incredible! And yeah, and then um, there's awards for commercials. Yeah. There are. <laughs> I did not know that. And then um, then I was working on Evangeline. So um, that's been just a passion project for a while. Uh, what is it called again? Evangeline. Evangeline. Yeah. Well, April, this was a lot of fun. It was fun. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. And chatting and sharing everything with us. Yeah. Um, let's do it again. It's a lot of fun. Uh, we got some uh, big projects coming up together, so. Why don't we revisit when we uh, <laughs> when we come back from those? Oh yeah, we I'm can like tell some stories together. I'd like, like, how was it working on that for you? I'd be like, Brian, I have more gray hair now. <laughs> right. Well, I hope not. I hope not. I hope not. But I just unf <laughs> I have unfor unfortunately, I think that's just part of the industry we're in. Yeah, it is. That's why we have hairstylists. Do hair <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> on set. On call. You know, that would be great, wouldn't it? Have a masseuse on set. Like, oh, rub out all the knots and stuff. Well, it was a pleasure, April. Thank you for sharing everything with us. Oh, you're and, welcome. Uh, you know, um, hope uh, everything goes well this year. COVID's kind of drifting away, and yeah. the productions also. Everybody learned how to work with COVID. Yeah. Uh, you know, and uh, you know, some shows have like little trackers on their crew for contact tracing. I thought, I'm like, oh, that's genius. In case someone something happens, you can figure out. Who Trace where. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's a whole nother yeah. podcast we could get into. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but yeah, they, but they've done a really good job trying to keep the crew safe. That's important. Yeah. It's a whole new learning curve for everyone and yeah. to, to, you know, get through that. All right. Well, thank you very much again. And You're welcome. I'll see you soon. Okay. All, All right. right. Thanks, Brian. Bye, everybody. <laughs>